Okay, this one's porn the porn plug. Okay, I hope I said that right. Wesley, let's go, give him a big hand. Thank you. So, uh, so how many of y'all out there have been uh, basically emptying the vendor area of all these uh, crazy little devices, pwn plugs, uh, pineapples, uh, I gotta watch my peas, uh, they've got a th this thing called a rutabaga now, uh, mini poners, things like that. How many of y'all have been buying these things? Make, some, make a little noise. All right, so uh, how many of y'all are gonna be using those for good? <laughs> How about for evil? Yeah. All right, so there, there's definitely some people doing some bad things with these things, and that's that's pretty cool. So what we have here is uh, why those of you who are using these things for good and for evil uh, might want to be a little more careful about when and where you turn these things on and how you use them. So the talk is Pwn the Pwn Plug, Analyzing and Counterattacking Attacker Implanted Devices. So the idea here is uh, we're, we're going to be breaking things that break things. Uh, my name is Wesley McGrew and I am uh, essentially the elder statesman of the Mississippi State contingent here, uh, effectively I guess DC 662. Uh, Mississippi State folks, make a little noise. Yeah. All right, great, cool. So. Uh, I'm, I'm an assistant research professor at Mississippi State University and also uh, I run McGrewSecurity.com and uh, the uh, McGrew Security Twitter account that you unfollowed last week. Uh, <coughs> so uh, what I do is I break things. That's, that's, uh, I, I love breaking things and uh, I'm occasionally good at it. Um, so, so I'm into any kind of vulnerability analysis, any kind of exploit stuff. Uh, I don't care what it is, I want to find the problems with it. Uh, I'm into reverse engineering. I teach a reverse engineering class at Mississippi State University that uh, went really well in the spring. And uh, I've also been involved in the National Forensics Training Center which teaches uh, free digital forensics classes to law enforcement and wounded veterans. Uh, recently I finished my dissertation. So I now have my PhD for those of you who keep bugging me every year at DEF CON to finish that up. Uh, so that's prepared me for my new role as the 12th doctor. Uh, <coughs> Uh, in the meantime, I'm a professor at Mississippi State University, uh, sort of leading the charge on doing some cool offensive breaking things type research. What we're going to be talking about today are attacker implantable devices and this is, is a sort of a, a term I've sort of applied to a wide variety of things. Uh, there's, a, there's a crisis of terminology for these things right now. Uh, the, the traditional name for these are a drop box and unfortunately there's a really bad name collision with that right now. Uh, <laughs> the storage guys kind of took that one from us. But what I'm talking about are, are all these little kind of all in one uh, embeddable type things that you can buy over there in the vendor area. Things like the Pwn plug, uh, the, the Pwn, uh, the power strip, uh, the Pwn, uh, whatever they call that one now. Uh, the, the, the Pwn plug R2 that just got released that I haven't had my chance, had, had a chance to get a hold of. Pwn pads, uh, you've got these little TP link router devices like you see in the lower left there uh, that, that can kind of run stripped down versions of open world. Uh, and finally the uh, Raspberry Pi. So, so these new uh, ARM sort of uh, credit card sized computers are perfect platforms for uh, this sort of uh, uh, activity. So uh, there's a basically a Pwn uh, OS type thing for the Raspberry Pi. I, I presume it's probably called the Raspberry Pwn but I can't remember right now. Uh, so these, the, the, what these things have in common is that they're small and they're what I call attacker implantable. Whether you're a pen tester or an, at, an attacker, uh, you can take these and hide them pretty much anywhere in an organization. And uh, you can use that as sort of your end. You can use it to sniff packets. You can use it to uh, launch attacks from. Uh, and it's basically, you know, a do-it-yourself pivot point in case uh, you suck at phishing and things like that. So. <clears throat> Oh, uh, these things have uh, applications for both penetration testers and malicious attackers. Uh, I'm sure all the, the, the folks that sell you these things want you to be a penetration tester but there's also something to be said for somebody uh, maliciously using one of these things. Uh, so the question here, or one question, if we're a good guy, uh, how do we respond to one of these that we find in our organization? So uh, we find a new toy in our server room 
that we did not purchase from Pony Express? Uh, and how did this get here? And uh, who's running it? And what is it doing to my network? Uh, and and uh, also, for both good and by, bad guys, what are the implications of there being vulnerabilities in these devices? Uh, so if I'm a penetration tester, what does it mean for my penetration testing tools to get attacked and compromised and uh, persistent compromise over a long period of time? If I am an organization that's found one of these that a malicious attacker has installed, can I counterattack it? Why not? Uh, and, and assuming all the, the legal considerations are in order, you know, we don't have the same, uh, we don't have the same sort of uh, problems with attribution of attack at this point. It's not like we're counterattacking some random IP address somewhere else on the internet and we don't know if uh, that's a hot point or not. Uh, if, there's, uh, if there's a pwn plug or some Raspberry Pi plugged up to our network inside our building that we don't know about, well, that's obviously uh, something we can attack. Uh, why not? I say why not. Uh, so uh, this slide is, is basically on identification and I'm not, I'm not going to go into all the different ways of identifying one of these on your network. Uh, honestly, if, you're, if, you're, if you've got proper or network access and control and monitoring in place and anything, you should see one of these things pop up the second it starts doing anything kind of noisy. Uh, physically, uh, they're meant to be uh, sort of inconspicuous but uh, to the trained eye, it's not so much. So you, you look at these things and the, those are the two stickers that, that come with the, the pwn plug one. Uh, and one of them has a reference to SSH on it and the other one is a printer power supply and I think that's the best application for the pwn plug itself is it, it looks like a printer power supply but it, part of its part number is 1337 so uh, okay. <laughs> I'm not ‑‑ actually now that I look at this picture, I'm not sure what the barcode is. It's probably like for a pack of Skittles or something. Who knows? Uh, but the, but so if you're if you're going to be a pen tester using these things, or even better if you're a malicious attacker using these things, uh, print up your own stickers. Like get get an HP like printer uh, power supply and run run that off on it. Uh, but if you find these things, that's uh, that's that's cause for concern. So what do we do? Uh, we we can respond to it. And so the first thing here, and and I, and I just love this picture because Riker's uh, hosting this thing. I, I forgot about that. Uh, First thing we want to do is, is pick this thing apart. What's going on with it? So uh, we, we want to seize this thing. We want to image it. We want to forensicate it. We want to figure out, out uh, what is it compromised already, uh, if we can find that out. Uh, we want to attribute this to somebody. Is this somebody inside our organization that's uh, trying to do their own sort of unauthorized pen test but they've got good intentions? Is it somebody who's managed to sneak in? Do we have a physical security problem now too? Uh, we want to know who's getting this sort of information back and there's a good chance that with these devices that you can, you can find, you know, uh, where is this thing phoning home? Who's grabbing the data off of it? And it may not be in the logs immediately because these things are small and they're meant to not log a whole lot anyways. So maybe we have to sit there and wait till somebody actually tries to connect to it and get their data off of it. So the challenge here for or forensics on these devices is essentially uh, uh, how. Uh, we know procedures for or pulling, uh, pulling the plug on a computer or, or, uh, or taking a RAM image and imaging a hard drive and things like that on a normal PC or Mac or something like that. But for an embedded device, I said, do we know exactly how we're going to acquire a forensic image of this thing uh, without uh, inadvertently changing evidence or destroying the thing or, or what have you or breaking it, you know? So, uh, so that's one concern is, is how do we do incident response on this? And another is uh, uh, if we decide to, uh, how do we counterattack it? And so uh, obviously if this thing's sitting in our organization, we can, uh, we can pull the plug on it and after we take our own forensic image of it, we blast our own image out to it that's backdoored to hell and back. And, and, uh, and, and that's not too terribly hard. Uh, but what if we want to attack it in place? We don't want to remove power from it. We want to compromise this thing as somebody is using it. Uh, and that's, that's the, the main beat meat of this talk. Uh, 
and, and so once we get into this thing, then we can monitor the attacker. We have a better chance at attribution. We have a better chance at determining the motive. I, I don't know about you, but I mean, it's okay to stop an attack, but I'd rather know who's trying to attack me and what are they trying to get at? Why, what are they after? Because that can help me defend against them in the future. Essentially, we can turn this device into a honeypot. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the vulnerable system that they are in uh, and trying to attack us from and we can monitor their actions from it. So for pen testers, the, the typical use case for this, uh, there's two different use cases. Uh, one is uh, the lazy pen tester who doesn't want to take a flight out and go in person and everything to do an internal uh, behind the firewall pen test sends it out and says plug it into the network here, plug it into the network here and sort of coordinates with the IT staff on this. And, uh, and so that's one use case for this and it's all set up, you know, plug in power, plug it in the network, it's ready to go, it phones home, it establishes an SSH connection, whatever. Then you have your nerdy James Bond type payload situation where this is somebody who's a little more sophisticated uh, pen tester and actually has a physical component to his penetration test where or he'll uh, go in and he'll drop this device off uh, surreptitiously in a network and this is the same thing that an attacker is going to do is he wants to put the, place this thing into a, a position on your network that, uh, that gives him access without anybody knowing about it. Uh, these devices are going to be typically are typically reused from test to test, client to client, I don't know, but it, it, they probably emp emptied your wallet over there at the vendor area when you bought one of these things. So uh, you're not leaving it anywhere permanently probably uh, unless uh, you're very malicious and you're, you're profiting enough from one of these to buy 50 more. Um, <coughs> And so when you're using this thing, but most pen testers are going to want to pick this thing back up and use it on their next client's engagement. So between these tests, are you wiping it? Do you know how to wipe this thing? It's an embedded device. Uh, it's the cleanup procedure on it may not be completely obvious as it would be, you know, where you can just blow out a new installation of uh, Windows or something. It's probably a little more complex than that. And are you actually bothering to do that from client A to client B? And that we can use that to our advantage when we attack these. From here on out, I'm basically going to take the stance of an attacker attacking pen testers because, as, come on, they deserve it, right? All right, so now we're going to put on our black hat. Uh, and this is the only free image of, of a cool looking black hat I could find on image search. Uh, I like this guy, he looks cool. Uh, so you put on your black hat and we're going to talk about hacking a pen tester's implantable device either in the field or on his bench. So uh, the attack that I'm going to talk about in the pawn plug here, er, uh, it's fine and dandy if you see this on, uh, on a, on a Client network, and uh, and you can compromise it using this act attack. But this attack can also be used if uh, the pen tester is testing the device or provisioning the device for a new test uh, on the bench in his lab, getting ready for a penetration test. It's so actually it might be even a little bit easier uh, due to the due to the way that we do this attack. Uh, the benefits of, uh, of an attacker doing this are great. So the implication of breaking into one of these devices and uh, before I get any further, if you're running a Wi-Fi pineapple, you might want to turn that off here pretty soon unless you want it bricked. Because uh, <coughs> somebody in here is going to do it uh, and they're going to do it fast. Uh, the implications of owning one of these things is uh, one, we can intercept things. So uh, if a penetration tester's doing the work for you, uh, he's scanning for vulnerability, he's breaking into systems. Uh, I don't have to do that now. So I just collect what, he, what that penetration tester is doing for me. Uh, and, and we can modify these results. So let's control what gets back to the penetration tester. He popped root on uh, the database server. Cool. Let's not let him know that and let's keep that for myself. Uh, and so we can filter these results and it never shows up in the report to the client. Uh, and, and everything's cool. Yeah, that database is totally secure. We can camouflage ourselves. Maybe the pen tester sucks and he's not running all the attacks that you want him to run. Well, just launch your own attacks from the device and it's a, the, the thing's supposed to be launching attacks so nobody's going to care. Uh, and so you, you, your, your attacks are part of the test at this point. And it's also competitive intel. If you've got a really clever pen tester that uh, leverages some ODA, you steal it. 
Uh, and essentially this is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, you can do this again and again as he reuses that device across multiple clients. Uh, uh, you can maintain access to these organizations. You can get back into the pen testers company's network whenever he takes it back home and plugs it up again. Cool stuff. So there's difficulties in preventing this sort of thing. So uh, and, and the reason why these sorts of systems have these vulnerabilities uh, is because uh, uh, they're, they're very small platforms and they're running sort of off the shelf penetration testing tools. Uh, these tools are, are, I mean, attack tools are great. You know, uh, people will write, you know, a quick uh, Python script to leverage some particular vulnerability or some particular network attack or something like that, and it'll work. And so everybody starts using it. But the problem is, is as soon as it works, uh, we're, we're very uh, fickle creatures. We we get something working and then we move on to the next attack. Uh, so we don't exactly, you know, do a whole lot of testing. We don't really think of the attack surface of our tools. So uh, if you think about penetration testing tools, uh, you're connecting to all sorts of services that are not under your control. Uh, these services is, uh, you know, implement protocols probably to a level that even your attack tool doesn't fully implement. Uh, you're pulling in data from lots of sources. You're parsing that data. You're parsing file formats. Uh, so your, your attack surface is essentially your entire code. If it didn't have to do with processing things from another service, uh, your your code wouldn't be doing it. So uh, essentially, a vulnerability in any part of your attack tool really opens up for you. Uh, most of these tools are proof of concept tools and that's always a disclaimer. That's always my disclaimer when I write a uh, security tool is this is a proof of concept. I got it working and then I stopped. Uh, and, and I'm as guilty of this as anybody. Uh, so so uh, the, the disclaimer there is don't use this in a production setting. Don't use this in your production malicious attack, your production penetration test unless you fully understand the implications of what you're doing and you can control it. Uh, but unfortunately these things are open source and uh, folks who put together these uh, small embedded attack appliances uh, will um, take, take these open source tools, put them on the devices as is and uh, wrap a user interface around it and send it out. So uh, uh, there's no there, at no point in this process is there any kind of audit of what are the vulnerabilities in these tools. Uh, these are very small, weird platforms. Uh, I mean, ARM is getting less and less weird, I guess. But uh, but these things are not, you know, these aren't PCs. These aren't, aren't these are outside of the comfort zone of a lot of the people who are using them. Uh, so once you get these tools running on that platform, then you just pray to God and you're like, all right, that's great. Let's just move on and do something else now. Um, when you send these things out there, out of your physical control. So uh, obviously uh, unless you're implementing some sort of uh, uh, encrypted file system on this thing and even then how would you do it? I mean nobody, who, where's your key? You know, how, who's going to type in a key on this thing once it's out there? So uh, it's hard to protect this thing once it's out of your physical control. We know, uh, I mean we have access to a computer, we have access to the USB port we're in. And finally, like the, up, uh, the update procedure for these things. Once they work, they work. Uh, the chances of somebody, uh, you know, actually seeking out between tests the new firmware for their pwn plug, the new firmware for their mini pwner or raspberry pwn or whatever is very slim. As long as this thing's working and doing the job, there's not a whole lot of chance that they're going to think to go out there and look for it. So it needs, if you're going to do something like this, it needs to be an automated update procedure. But you can't au have automatic updates on a, one of these devices out in the field. That'll be a whole new attack surface for me to talk about next year. Uh, so, <coughs> so these things will run old code and they'll run old code for a very long time. Security geeks are easy targets. So uh, there's, there's, it's hard. There's, a, there's another problem. I talked about the, the problem of, uh, of the naming scheme for these types of devices, you know, Dropbox being taken. Uh, and so I'm going with the wordy attacker implantable devices. There's also a similar semantics problem with doing research on this problem. So if we're talking about finding vulnerabilities in vulnerability analysis software, that's a really tough thing to Google. 
uh, finding exploits in in in, uh, in pen testing software very not not exactly the easiest uh, uh, research area, but there's a lot of it out there, and there's a lot more that's yet to be found. So I'm not sure who 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 is currently working on breaking things that break things, but uh, but there's a lot left out there. Uh, you're already familiar with the million bajillion Wireshark vulnerabilities out there, and that's very typical of this genre of software. We're talking about things that implement protocols, parse things, and have a huge attack surface. Uh, we have, uh, you know, vulnerability, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in Metasploit. We have uh, some screenshots of the titles of talks that are here at DEF CON and uh, and 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 uh, back at Black Hat uh, this past weekend. So uh, the tools that security geeks use are no less vulnerable or perhaps even more vulnerable than the tools we're attacking uh, because there just hasn't been enough attention and there's not been enough audit on the on these tools. So the case study for this and, and I'm picking on the pwn plug for this but uh, honestly uh, these same problems exist in, in other devices. Uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but, but today we're going to be playing with the pwn plug. I have one plugged up underneath the podium here and wired up and everything and hopefully it will behave itself long enough for a, a good demo at the end of this. Um, <clears throat> what we have is a discussion of the forensics of it and a demo of a counter attack against this thing or a, a straight up attack against it. Depends on how you look at it. So for forensic acquisition of a palm plug, so this is what I do the first time I get a hold of any new devices. I want to know how to perform a forensic analysis of this thing which involves imaging it which basically gives me something that I can go back to the original state of the device when I screw it up when I attack it. So, uh, so, so forensic acquisition is always something that I'm interested in. Uh, there's explicit detail in the white paper for this. I haven't looked at the DVD. My retina doesn't have a DVD drive on it. But the DVD that came with the conference materials has uh, the white paper for this, it has these slides, it has all the attack code and payloads and all the crap that you need to do this stuff for your own. Uh, but the white paper has all the stuff about the forensics of this. So I'm not going to go into all the different U-boot commands and things like that. But the essential step for this is, uh, the essential idea of this is that uh, the, the uh, Pwn plug which is based off of the Shiva plug platform, so if you want to play around with these devices you can just buy a, a little $99 Shiva plug. Uh, honestly, nowadays you're better off of like a Raspberry Pi or something. But uh, uh, the idea is this Shiva plug hardware that the Pwn plug is based on uh, it can boot off of a USB drive if you uh, ask it too nicely. Uh, essentially, you can grab a Debian image for Shiva plug, uh, and which will have everything you need to DD a drive. And more, more importantly, you're not relying on the file system and tools that's already on the Pwn plug itself. Uh, you can if you can boot it up into the serial console, interrupt you boot, uh, tell it to load a kernel in a file system off the USB drive, and go, and it'll boot up into your USB drive instead of the Shiva plug. And so you can play around with some alternate firmware for for this thing without blowing away the the base install on it too. But more importantly for forensics is you can DD the root file system once you uh, get in there. Uh, now it's just as it turns out it's just as well on this device just to copy you know from root down uh, since uh, since for the analysis of it you know the UBI file system that's on these devices and other similar compressed file systems are on a lot of these embedded devices. Our options for forensic analysis on these are kind of limited. So uh, there's lots of compression on these. Uh, at any given point, you don't necessarily know exactly how much free space you have. Uh, depends on what you're storing, really. Um, the 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 flip side of this for forensics is uh, you can probably forget about recovering deleted files on this thing because the whole thing's part of this sort of compressed image, and if you lose chunks of it, you know you're you're basically out of luck with the rest of it. the rest of it is just noise. So uh, b there's really no tools for doing good forensic analysis that I know of right now for recovering deleted files and things like that. But if you have the file system image, which you can then blow out to another phone plug if you wanted to, so that's useful. Uh, you can use MTD utils on un on Linux to uh, to mount this image and start processing it at the at the uh, logical file system level. You can go through and look at the files and things. Uh, these devices support attached storage, and the storage on board most of them is fairly limited. 
So the nice thing about this is doing forensics on the little small USB drive that's hooked up to this thing, it's going to be a lot easier uh, than doing the, f the forensics on the device itself. And, uh, and it's going to be standard procedures. You know, pop the thing out, hook it up to the FTK manager through a write blocker if you please and, uh, and start analyzing. And chances are it's going to be a, a normal-ish file system. It's going to be EXT or FAT32 or something like that. And the cool thing is is the stuff that's going to be on that, that's going to be the real goods there. That's going to be all your packet data and things like that that aren't necessarily feasible to store on the internal storage. Uh, the cool thing about these devices is that anything that's different from the base image, let me see, anything that's different from the base image on uh, one of these pwn plugs is, uh, is likely to be of interest to you because it's something that's changed. It's something that's, as a, re that's a result of the, uh, the attacker using it or a result of, uh, of the tools that are running on it as a result of network traffic coming into it. So uh, what you can do is you can take that file system that you've acquired and run it through uh, FTK or, or whatever tools you have for making a known file hash set, hash all the files on the base image. You can download the base images off of Pony Express or whatever. So you have that hash set and you look at this file system and you blow away everything that matches the hashes in there. Oh, that's, that's, I don't care about that. That's the same as the factory config. Then the files that are left are the files that are going to tell you something. Cool stuff. Now we're going to get into attacking these things. We're going to put our black hat back firmly on and we're going to attack some penetration testers. Um, the particular exploit that we're dealing with here is in the Pwn plug user interface. So congratulations for those of you who bought a Shiva plug and put the, 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 uh, the, the community version, the free version of the Pwn plug uh, firmware on it. You're not vulnerable to this. Uh, this is only in the interface, the web-based interface that's on the commercial versions that they, that they sell to you. So uh, this plug UI or Ponix, uh, I've seen it called both things in different parts of the uh, documentation. This user interface is a web interface for the commercial version of the Pwn plug and it lets you do things like turning on passive recon uh, so you can sniff HTTP requests, look at the passive OS discovery stuff, set up the reverse tunnels and things like that. Um, and, and so there's, there's all sorts of fun things that this interface can do. Uh, they tell you in the documentation to uh, if you're going, when you put this thing into stealth mode, if you're going to have it in stealth mode in an organization, this interface is enough and going. Uh, the problem is, is you can't do some of these cool graphical things. So you know, a lot of people aren't going to put it in stealth mode. Uh, who cares if it's noisy? Uh, another thing is, is when you're setting it up uh, on the bench back home, uh, back at your lab or whatever, uh, chances are you're going to be using this interface. So how do we break it? So we have a bunch of boring vulnerabilities. So yes, I did get a, a DEF CON talk accepted for cross-site scripting. No, uh, but these these are very boring vulnerabilities. They're they're easy vulnerabilities. So if if you're not if you haven't attacked much, uh, uh, you're gonna you're gonna be able to follow this. We have three different vulnerabilities in this. We have some cross-site scripting, boring. We have some cross-site request forgery, that's everywhere, uh, and sort of interesting. We have some command injection, so we can run commands on this device. That's kind of cool, but you have to be logged in to do it. So who cares? But if we combine these exploits, let's say we uh, we'll say our cross-site scripting is in, is uh, triggered by an injected packet that we send to this thing. It doesn't have to be directly to it. It can be anything that it sniffs. So we we send a packet to this thing. So that's a cool way of triggering XXS. Cool, uh, better than you know phishing emails or or links on Twitter and things. What if our XSS payload triggers the cross-site request for, for the cross-site request forgery vulnerability? Uh, so uh, we have a, a one page on the interface that's vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Uh, that payload hits another page that we can submit forms to on the behalf of our penetration tester. Cool. What does that get us? Well, our cross-site request forgery is in the page that has command injection. So why don't we have our cross-site request forgery vulnerability, our, our payload, uh, go ahead and inject a command for us on the, again on the behalf of the penetration tester that's logged in. As a result, we get 
remote root. So cross site request for or cross site scripting leading to remote root on this. And uh you know it requires a little bit of setup. I mean it has to be you know uh, the stars aligned but it's a pretty realistic scenario. And I'm going to make y'all watch that slide again because the animations are cool. Boom. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Th it's it's all down to keynote on that. I didn't you know I didn't render that fire myself. So, so here's your, your payload. Uh, this is what you send in the uh, exploit packet to the device. You, this is what you're going to pass into, uh, into HPing to get this thing rolling. So uh, this part of it right here just passes the regex to get it, to get it onto the passive recon page. Uh, th this is what it's looking for in a packet. Uh, you know, you might want to make something a little more believable than user agent hi. Um, this is the bit that you need to get cross site scripting going on. Everything inside of that's going to render in the page and we'll see that in a bit. The cross site request forgery in here, we've got a form in here and you've got a whole bunch of crap that you have to fill out for this form to actually take. Uh, but we submit this to the SSH tunnel setup page on the Pwn plug interface. And it goes ahead and submits it on the penetration tester's behalf. Then finally, the command injections in there, uh, and, and this can be in any field. Uh, th th these same vulnerabilities, these exist throughout this interface. So, uh, so basically, uh, you can mutate this to go to basically any page on the on the palm plug. Uh, so basically, what we have here is the SSH tunnel IP address is now semicolon cd user bin uh, wget my uh, malware, uh, run it, remove it. And keep going. So what do we run as a result of this? So we're not, you know, we're not alerting XSS here. We're we want to do something with this. So there's some proof of concept. Of, uh, see my disclaimer: proof of concept. Don't run this in the real world, or you'll get owned. Uh, my proof of concept malware is Pwnmon, uh, and it, it's not specific to this device. You can not adapt this to anything. It's just a crappy little Python script. But uh, it's a little bit better than Alert One, Alert XSS, uh, and then it cleans up a bit after itself. Uh, it installs itself uh, into user bin, user s bin. It uh, sets up some persistence in RC local and cron and all that crap to make sure that it keeps running. Uh, it sets up a, a lock file so that it doesn't run more than once at a time. Uh, the pwn plug specifically disables the bash history for the root user. I go ahead and re-enable that so I can keep up with command logs. And uh, occasionally it phones home and tries to get more code to run because that's awesome. Uh, and every so often uh, it gathers a process list, a command history, uh, file listing, a uh, set of network interfaces and connections, all the log files for the most interesting tools in the pwn OS. And uh, wraps it up and sends it to my FTP server. So this is something that you can kind of start from on this. So the demo for this, uh, there's everything you need to replicate this uh, on the DVD. Uh, you need a floor model or above pwn plug, an actual commercial pwn plug to, to replicate this uh, from, from those guys at the vendor area. Tell them I sent you. Uh, tell them if there's a patch for this to give you the old one. <laughs> so that you can play with this. Uh, or just use an unsuspecting friend or enemies. So we're going to bounce out of here and hopefully this demo will work. If not, I have a recording. All right, so uh, what we have here is, and we'll take you on a tour of the, of the different views here. What we have here is our, our hapless penetration tester setting this thing up. Uh, over here we have our attacker. Basically, with uh, you know where he's launching the attack from, and the web server that he's hosting this stuff off uh, the FTP, and some info on what's going on here. The the players that we have here are, are the pwn plug on 10, the pen tester slash victim uh, on 15, and the attacker here on 20. Uh, and here we have basically a view on the code of the uh, pwnmon software in case I want to refer to anything for y'all. Uh, what we're going to do, first off, we're going to start up our attacker web server so that uh, we have this. I'm going to show you what's in here right now. 
the UBI.py. Now these UBI file names, uh, since I had to do a bunch of research to figure out what the hell's going on with the UBI file system, I figure adding some more UBI named commands to this operating system uh, is a good way of hiding my malware in that, you know, none of it makes sense anyway. So, so uh, we have, have uh, UBI.py and UBI mount here. Uh, UBI.py is the Ponmon malware. UBI mount is the command that uh, or the file on the web server that Ponmon occasionally pulls for new commands and I'll show you what's in that. At, and, uh, okay, you know, classic, you know, uh, bind shell type uh, crap here. Uh, we're going to host this web server. If you learn nothing else from this talk, you can set up a web server out of your current directory with just that command and that's just tons of fun, speed setting up Apache or whatever. Uh, don't, you know, run your blog off of it or anything but <laughs> payloads are great. So, so that just fires you up a, a web server on port 8000. Cool. Um, let's see, we're, the poem plug's still awake, that's good. Uh, we have our FTP dead drop here where it's going to go and everything seems fine. So we're going to be the hapless penetration tester again and we're going to turn on the uh, under plug services here. We're going to turn on the passive recon stuff. Uh, oh dear, we were already, uh, I may have already triggered the vulnerability. That's cool. <laughs> so he's going to enable this and we're going to see here in a second whether or not that's actually, so we're enabled. We're going to see over here. It doesn't, hasn't requested anything yet, so that's good. It might not. So, what we're going to do is we're going to. We have our exploit payload there, which I reviewed with you. And just a simple HPing command sends this out. And so, there's a, there's a trick to this. We have, we're sending it 10 times because uh, it's kind of goofy. The, uh, the passive recon page is pulling from uh, a log file and unless we send, unless there's a good bit of traffic on the network, it takes a bit for the buffers to flush and for it to actually show up in the page. So I just send it 10 times. The exploit is set not to run more than once anyway. Sometimes it'll request two of them but whatever. Um, so we're going to blast that out and while that's going I'm going to set up inspect element on this guy right here so we can see it when it shows up. All right, so let's, uh, let's inspect right here. So what we see here is our, you know, cookie high form, all that crap going on there. So pretty soon we should see requests here and we have. So the cross-site scripting vulnerability has, come on, get me off the blue screen here. Unhighlight all. All right, the the it has set up a standard reverse SSH shell of get all my crap, uh, and that's scheduled to run every minute. And thankfully, it's already run. It sometimes if you hit it wrong, I'd be standing here and have to tell you a joke or something before it actually does anything. But uh, it's gotten the USB UBI mount uh, 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 script for code to run. Uh, it's already phoned in with a uh, uh, basically a tarred up uh, image of all the cool crap on the pwn plug. And so let's take a look at what we've got here. Uh, with the UBI mount, we should have a reverse shell running. So NC192.168.9.10 on port, I think it was 9000. Yep. Drum roll, please. Root. I've always wanted to do that on stage at DEF CON. Uh, <laughs> all right, so over here at our, de our FTP dead drop, this is actually cooler. Who cares about getting root? We want to get stuff, loot. All right, so what we have here, and this is actually kind of funny, the, uh, the, the, the pwn plug isn't so hot on its uh, real time clock or anything. So this is time stamped. Uh, so with Unix timestamps and you'll notice I have the underscore and a dash here and I was like, uh, I fucked up in my script and I, and I have a dash in here also. No, that's a negative timestamp there. So <laughs> my, my pwn plug has lost its shit and we'll see what it thinks the time is. Oops. What? Oh, uh, what? <laughs> what the hell is going on here? Oh, I see. It's uh, it's already grabbed another one. <laughs> okay, we'll grab that one. 
implausibly old timestamp 1946. We have defeated the Germans and and now we're wrecking shit at Bletchley Park, I guess. Um, so. So uh, what we have in here, and, and it, you couldn't see it from that because it was complaining about the timestamps, is we have you know a listing of files, interfaces, uh, logs from Metasploit, John, Bluetooth. Uh, we've got the command histories and things like that on here, and everything on this device runs as root. So, so uh, the, the web interface is running as root. So there was no, nothing to keep us from doing any of this. And that's uh, let's see, that's about it. The whole thing's broken now, and it takes like ten minutes to get everything back into a good state. So, I'm glad that worked. So back to my slides, wherever those are, and so for conclusions for this, uh, these attacker and plan devices uh, can provide good counter intel info. If you find one of these in your organization as a defender, or, uh, it's a curse I suppose uh, <laughs> depending on what they've already gotten but you also have, you know that somebody was there that's going against you and also you've got all the tools in front of you and ne that are necessary to, uh, to start counter attacking this thing and doing forensics on it to figure out who is doing this to me and why and what are they after? What have they already got? For those of you who are pen testers out there, for those of those very few of you who actually said that you're going to use these devices for good, uh, know your tools, test your tools, use them safely. Hell, if you're an attacker, do that. Um, monitor carefully and clean up between uh, engagements and things like that. Um, uh, you need to be a little more literate with your penetration testing tools than simply using them. You need to understand how they work. You need to maybe even try breaking them every once in a while. And for breaking things, people who break things, uh, pen testing tools make good targets. So uh, with that, I appreciate y'all coming to my talk. Uh, there is no Q&A room, so uh, you're just going to have to track me down before I go off and, and get bored and do something else. Uh, thank you.